I'm delighted to be hosting the panel here today at the Langham, where I actually worked as a diplomatic sales manager for over four years um, before starting my business um, over 13 years ago. But today, I want to welcome my panel of industry experts, and I'm first going to ask them to introduce themselves and their companies to you. Hi, I'm Farima Perry, and I run a florals and events business. My name's Sasha Cullen, and slightly loud, Sasha Cullen, and I'm head of weddings at the Savoy London, which is a luxury hotel, if you know of it. <laughs> Hi, I'm Kay Patel, and I'm the co-founder of Intricate Creations. We're responsible for the invitations you all received. <laughs> um, I'm Daisy Amodi. I'm the founder of The Proposers, which is a marriage proposal planning company. I'm Claire Patak, and I'm the founder of Violet Cakes. We make uh, wedding cakes and all kinds of cakes, and also have a cafe in East London. Today we're looking at climbing the ladder, but my first question, I want to go right back to the start of your careers. Claire, you've recently baked a fairly prestigious cake for Prince Harry and Meghan Markle's wedding, but can you tell me where you got your inspiration for baking? Uh, yeah, I started baking as a child, like many pastry chefs do, actually, with mom and uh, grandma. Um, and I really loved it, and I uh, never thought it would be a profession for me. And I studied film and wanted to be uh, Quentin Tarantino, if I'm honest, um, <laughs> many years ago. And then, uh, but I always baked every day, and I read every cookbook, and I was obsessed with it. And I finally realized that that was what I should do professionally, so I became a pastry chef. Um, and the rest is history. Can you tell us a bit about your story, how you grew your business, and what couple of elements are you know, key to you to, to get up that ladder? I think the key for me is really authenticity um, and integrity. I think if you love what you do and you believe in what you do, I know that this is something that's said quite a lot, but I really think it shines through. I mean, I, have, I started as a market stall uh, trader and baked out of my home and then I got a small bakery and um, this year we're opening or 2020 we're opening a second bakery uh, much like four times the size <laughs> um, quite stressful but um, really exciting and uh, writing cookbooks I'm, I'm writing another one this year and then also doing some television so all these things have happened and are happening and it's really exciting, but really I've just stayed true to myself and what I like and then, as they say, build it and they come, so it's good. Fantastic. So Farima, you have a very interesting background. I understand you're still a lawyer and now you're Best Wedding Designer nominee. Can you tell us how you actually achieved that? Uh, yes, I can tell you a very long story, but or I could tell you my shorter version. Um, I basically qualified as a lawyer about 18 years ago. Um, and when I started training, um, my supervisor at that point made some very, uh, said something to me that really stuck with me. Mm -hmm. He is now my husband. We weren't dating. Law Society, <laughs> if you're listening, we weren't dating at all. Um, and he said, um, you are the average of the five people that you surround yourself with. It's a very famous saying. And he said, you know, if you want to get ahead, if you want to do well, if you want to work hard and you want to make something of yourself, audit the people around you. And that was very, very Point. important, very harsh. I thought, oh God, you're really horrible. But it was something very, very true. And um, I worked really hard. In those days, it was, Actually, I was in a, in a market, or I was an Asian person, an Asian lawyer. It was actually really, really hard. I did a banking degree first, then I did a law degree. And I just wanted to be in a, in a niche on my own. So I worked really, really hard, and that has been my work ethic, I would say. I have, I put everything into it. I became a deal lawyer. I would work three months in a row with very little sleep, get the deal done. and. That, I think, has helped me to transition into doing my real passion. So 17 years down the line, that's a long story, but 17 years down the line, um, I thought, I'm a little bored. What do I really want to do? Mm -hmm. What's my passion? So I um, said, I love flowers. So my husband said, go and do some courses, because he had no faith. He thought, she's going to be rubbish. How can she... <laughs> she do anything in flowers. She likes admiring them. And he actually said, yeah, you like looking at them. That's about it. So I went to do some courses, and I did two years of courses and floristry diplomas, mm. and 
event accreditations and just tried to learn as much as I possibly could, applying that mantra, you know, do as much as you can, work as hard as you can, surround yourself with really good people who are so much better than you and they will lift you up. And that is exactly what, did. Mm -hmm. that is exactly what I've tried to do. I have the most amazing people around me, the most amazing mentors who I am forever grateful for. Bride Lux have been absolutely amazing. They have completely plucked me out of somewhere and put me in another place, and I am forever grateful to Bride Lux for doing that. Um, there's been luck on my side. Um, I opened the boutique last year in February, um, and in one year, in 12 months, we're now in Harvey Nichols. Fantastic. So it, it, I don't sleep. <laughs> Thank you. I don't sleep. I haven't slept for a while, but <laughs> uh, yeah, but I mean, that's, that's how we've done it. And I don't know, let's see how, what, how this will take us or where this will take us, but. How did you get that opening into the Harvey Nichols? Um, the COO called me and said, we love your brand. Oh, um, I'd like you to come in. Oh, how long have you been around? I said, one year. She goes, really? And I think at that point she thought, oh, maybe I shouldn't call you. Um, and then I said, yeah, one year. And she said, no, we love it. Um, please come in. And that was it. Amazing. Fantastic. Yeah. Brilliant. So, okay. Um, I'm sure people are curious as to where you started from. Can you tell us a bit about your first order and the order you're working on now? Nearly 10 years on. Of course. I think there's going to be a little shiver from Jit, who's my other half of intricate creations in the audience. Um, we, the very first order we did was actually to the value of £200 for 50 invitations. Mm -hmm. um, and we actually made a loss, a confession, we made a loss on the order, purely because of the fact that it didn't pass our QC. We didn't like it. It wasn't, it wasn't up to our expectations. So we remade it. And that's basically the ethos of, in, of intricate creations. Um, if, if it's something that I personally or my husband wouldn't send out, then it's not going out. We'd rather our reputation is more important than obviously the actual item exactly. being a poor item. Um, but now, nearly 10 years on, um, we are now making invitations that cost 200 pounds each. Um, that's not to say that's all of the invitations that we make, um, <laughs> but that's where we are at now. And I think the most, memorable recent order mm. daisy's client was one of them um but also we have we were and one of sasha's client actually um <laughs> i'm surrounded by them um they were um they're actually saudi royalties who actually um who we were had the pleasure to work with um but also asked us to make an invitation personally for our Majesty, the Queen. Um, so we were very proud of the fact that we've made an invitation for Our Majesty. And, mm. um, and today is one of the most expensive invitations that we've made. She didn't come, sadly. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> there, was, there, was, Damn it. there was a little bit of, you know, if you're going to make it. But the invitation was sent two weeks prior to the client's wedding. And I think the Queen were, had prior engagements. <laughs> so um, so that, that just, for me, shows the growth of Absolutely. intricate creations. Absolutely. Um, but that's not to say we don't make £200 invitations all the time. <laughs> just make that straight. You mentioned that intricate creations have been going for nearly 10 years. Have you seen a change in social media platforms? And are there some that are more effective for you? Oh yeah, 100%. Um, when we first started out, Instagram and um, Facebook and that was not as big as Twitter was. Twitter was the B2B at that moment in time. And it was more about getting our name to align our brand with brands, other brands that you wanted to be with. Um, now, ten, nearly 10 years on, it's definitely picture orientated. Um, so images, it's you know, those images are priceless. They get out to the media, they get out to the volumes across the world so quickly and so fast that, you know, before you even send, press send and you've got an inquiry, which is amazing. Um, but it, I wouldn't say it's the be all end all from our social media, uh, from a marketing platform for us. Um, 
uh, what was I going to say, word of mouth is the most important marketing tool for us. But social media has been a big part of our lives. But I would say right now, Instagram and Facebook for B2B, but also B2C. And Daisy, can you tell us how you actually started a whole new industry? So my brother asked me to plan his proposal uh, back in 2011. And I absolutely thoroughly enjoyed planning his proposal. And afterwards, I Googled proposal planner and nothing in the world at the time came up. And I just thought, is this a new idea? Is it a good idea? I I basically I put a questionnaire together and I sent it to 500 men and most of them said what's wrong with getting down on one knee why do we need to spend money on this and the people that knew me said why would you give up your good job in a recession to do something that's unknown or not unknown but I just didn't listen to anyone and I just thought in my heart of hearts that it would work and eight and a half years later um, I've planned over 1,500 proposals around the world. I've got a team of five in Soho, and oh. um, our budgets are range from £1,000 to £800,000, so very different. Amazing. And it's led to many other things. That's amazing. You knew 500 men? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes. Can you tell us how you gained your worldwide press and TV show for such a small business, and how how's social media helped your business? I think because the business is so niche, I'm not saying that I'm the only proposal planner now, there's probably about 60 companies mainly in America, but there isn't anyone here. Um, I Probably about six months after launching, I had TV production companies coming to me every week saying you should be a TV show because it's lighthearted, it's fun, it's quirky, every proposal is different because the client's relationship is different. And I just thought, oh, I'm not really ready for TV, I don't really understand it, but 16 meetings later with an agent, she got assigned there and there to a Sky TV deal and it, they followed us around for six months. That went to 12 countries around the world and that did it help us. I think it helped us in a way that um, guys can then go and view it and see that we're real people because when you're setting up something that's new and no one knows who you are, did they trust you and who are they parting money with, that helped because they could see us. Off the back of that, we get we get press every week. I mean, literally five minutes before I sat down, I did an article with The Telegraph. Last week we were in The Sun, the week before The Guardian. And Sunday, I think, Minnie, where were we? Sun Tower Bridge filming live on German TV, uh, 7 p.m. Sunday night. So, um, yeah, lots of stuff going on. It's all exciting. Very exciting. And Sasha, can you tell us a bit about your background and what brought you to the Savoy? We all want to know. To be honest, I asked myself the same question. I mean, hands up in the audience. The job you're in now, did you plan to be there? No one. You know, none of us really plan to be there. And I think there's sort of two sides to my story, uh, if anyone's interested. But I think it really comes down to, I'm a big believer in if you set a goal, you set a vision, and you work hard to achieve it, you will really be there. And I never intended, to be honest, to come back in hotels. I wasn't a banker, wasn't a lawyer. There's so many different people that started... <coughs> Um, in such a random way and got into events. But I actually started in weddings. Um, so I started when I was 23 in the Ice Chapel in Lapland. I had an amazing season there running all the weddings in the Ice Chapel and was really fortunate to then um, work in Cyprus for a year, doing all the weddings on the yachts. And I vowed after doing all them weddings in 50 degree heat, I would never speak to a bride ever again. <laughs> <laughs> like genuinely. And you know, the more philosophical, more romantic way of it is, I remember to this day being on an interview with a headhunter, my, my sister had just had a little girl, and I thought, Sasha, get a grip, stop yoloing, you know, you need to go home. Um, and I was on my interview, I had fresh flowers in my hair, I just picked off the trees in Cyprus, I was stealing Wi-Fi from downstairs, because my company didn't <laughs> give me Wi-Fi, hard times. And they said to me, where do you see yourself mm. in five years? I mean, I was 23, and I was mm. thinking, I just need a job, like, I don't, you know, I'm enjoying being on the beach and just going out every weekend. I don't really have a plan. Um, and I think that put it into perspective because I just said to him, you know, I just need some wedding experience, wedding and event experience in the UK. I'll work at the Holiday Inn now. I mean, <laughs> I think it's just crazy. Um, you know, I'll work at the Holiday Inn. I said, but when I'm like 30, I'd really love to, to you know, run a massive country estate with deer and loads of land to play with and do all these amazing events, which I was able to do on the beaches in Cyprus. And then one day, just imagine when I'm really, really old, I could work at the Savoy. And it's just so incredible now that um, five years on, I'm here. And I didn't plan to be here. I didn't plan to be in London. I was used to actually go to Dubai. I accepted a role in Dubai. Um, but I was done with Yorkshire people, not in a bad way, because I love Yorkshire. My but Yorkshire. I love Yorkshire and I love Harrogate, obviously from Manchester. But I thought to myself, 
I work so much, everyone knows. It's so amazing today, actually, that there's so many venues here. Hands up if you're from a venue. Yes, yes, yes. Venues and events. So I think it's really important that people see a career in venues and hotels because it's just such a massive industry. And also, moving to London enabled me to work with you know, everyone in this room, really, just the most incredible people that are the best at what they do. And for any of you that have worked in a country venue, you know, you get these amazing clients, you secure this luxury, um, you know, budget, you then plan it till, you know, you, you literally plan it to the inch of your life. And then you get there and the team just aren't as passionate as you. And anyone who's worked in country venues, maybe with agency or, you know, kids really that are just coming from, you know, their university break, they just don't have that passion. And I think I was done with that. So when I got the call to come for the interview at Savoy, uh, to be honest, I was done with hotels. I was like, that's it. I'm going to work from a production company. I'm going to work at a directory. I literally cannot speak to these brides anymore. And when I came down to Savoy, this is the truth, um, I came down to the Savoy, and the minute I walked in, mm. honestly, the doorman, and mm. I actually say this as part of one of our HR mm -hmm. functions, the doorman, as I walked in, I had a coffee in Melbourne, not knowing that Melbourne was owned by Savoy. <laughs> and I was on the phone to my mum saying all sorts of stuff. Um, mm -hmm. And I walked through the doors, and he <coughs> said to me, oh, what are you here for? And I thought, oh my God, he's Northern. We are going to be best friends. <laughs> and he said, are you here for an interview? And I said, yeah, he went. Aww. Good luck, good luck, hon. And I was like, you, feel you are the nicest man mm. in my life. <laughs> and then I got the job, and then a couple of um, sort of weeks later, I saw him again, and he was like, told you you'd get the job. And I thought, things don't like, like that don't happen by chance. Sure. And from the flowers, to the piano, to the candles, if you haven't been in Savoy, go in there. But any five-star luxury hotel in London, to me, just has this romance about it where mm. anything is possible. But that's only possible by everyone in this industry. And that's what me and Penny, my little wedding duo, we love that because we can't create things without the right people. So yeah, that's how I ended up there. Fantastic. And it's been magic since day one. Fantastic, thanks so much. And another question I had, going back to the Savoy, what instigated the rebrand? I'm sure we all want to know. Can you tell us a bit about that, how that yeah, went so about? Yeah, so I think it's important with any company, obviously, to constantly be refreshing and innovating. And I've been quite fortunate that the other estates that I've worked at in the UK, but even in Cyprus, I was part of the relaunch of the new brochure. Two in First Choice had just merged, and we did a lot of projects with, with exclusive yacht weddings. It was during the banking crisis in Cyprus as well, so we couldn't get any money out of any of the banks. Um, so we, we went through a lot, basically. We got new licenses, new venues. So I'd always have been part of this change. And when I moved to London, I was like, I can't just be part of you know a day-to-day -day job where I go in do my job and come home that's just not me so when I went for the interview everyone will remember Savoy maybe five years ago not in weddings but the actual hotel it was kind of nose diving a little bit like to be honest it was going off the page a little bit and we had the right people in place but not the right strategy and when I went to the interview two and a half years ago and I sat there with Micah she said to me look get on the train with us, like, you're just so passionate, you know, we're really excited to work with you, we've just got a new managing director, Mr Barnes, who is still there with us today, and honestly, since day one, he's championed change, and I believe everyone should always relook at their business and say, how can we do it better? And people might not believe it, because, you know, you think the Savoy, it's five star, it's mm. going to be perfect, we're always exceeding guest expectations, but to be honest, even with my humble background, and I've only been in the industry seven years, I literally came to the Savoy, got into my position, and it was me who instigated the rebrand because I was like, we're not wow. up to par. We're not giving our couples what they need. Mm -hmm. And we'd also had a lull. We had a year, a year before I joined, we'd parted ways with Bruce Russell. So it was kind of this in-between dark area mm -hmm. where everyone was like, is it Bruce, is it not? What's is it going you? on? Like, is there anyone? And there, there was no one. There was conference people, not in a bad way, but in hotels, there was conference organizers speaking to brides and the journey just wasn't right. So yeah, we've been on a massive, massive journey the past two and a half years, instigating the new rebrand, the new website, soylondon.com, all of our Instagram handles, photo shoots, things like bride looks. And again, like Freema said, I think it's important to align yourself with the brand, but also separate. And that's what the Savoy is about. We're, we are part of Fairmont, of course, and we're really proud of that but I think when you think of the Savoy you would never think of Fairmont and that's what we've tried to do with Savoy weddings is really create that gorgeous customer journey but not just about sales you know we talk about Alan Berg I'm literally obsessed with, with sales mm -hmm. and weddings yeah. because it's so difficult for us in hotels I sit in these revenue meetings and people say why is it taking you six months to convert that wedding 
You know, why isn't it taking you a day like all the conference and the group team? They don't get it. And maybe we need Alan Bird to come to this advice because <laughs> the psychology of the cell is completely different. We're dealing with emotions. They might have a bereavement. They might fall out. Mm. It's such a longer sale and we're so invested in them, which means not just the sales process needed to change for us. We changed the, obviously the website, the emails, but also how I was running them. The first wedding I watched, I was literally shell-shocked. I mean, the team were incredible on the ground, but we weren't using really many suppliers. The room, mm -hmm. if anyone's seen our normal linen, people were using normal linen. <laughs> the plum linen with the top white cloth, which I am not into. And we just literally said to ourselves, this can't happen anymore. No. Mm -hmm. So we literally started from the ground up, from the processes, the SOPs. When Penny joined me a year ago, she's really championed that change from the operational perspective and me on more the strategic. So yeah, Fantastic. that's what we've been doing. We've been busy. Very busy, it sounds like. I know that in any business, it's important to develop and grow and push a company forward. So Farima, I'd really be interested to know what's kind of your plan now moving, moving on. I didn't actually have any plans when I opened my boutique last year, I was just very grateful that I'd had a flower shop, finally. Um, I am not quite sure, watch this space, but I think um, that global expansion is probably on the on cards. On the cards for you. Um, because ha we're in talks with Harvey Nicks to expand globally across their right. branches. So we may be doing that, but also I think destination weddings, more weddings abroad. That's what on the event side you. of things. Mm -hmm. There are two separate businesses now running, so mm -hmm. I'm hoping that's what we're, we're, where we're where going. going to go. Fantastic. Yeah. And Kay, being in the creative industry, do you find making time to go out and find inspiration important? Kind of what, what tips and advice do you, would you give? It's been a bit of a topic this, this day, hasn't mm. it, about inspiration? Um, 100%. Um, but finding time is the first thing. Um, just become a mummy, as many of you may have known. So time is very precious, but inspiration can be found anywhere, in this room, on the ceiling. Um, Jit, my other half, finds inspiration from a napkin. So, you know, it's anywhere and anywhere. I don't know where the napkin comes from. Um, but anywhere and everywhere. But it is important to have that time. But I think also creativity is also, for us personally, is driven from our clients. Um, their budgets, so the money they're willing to invest in us, I should say, is obviously very important for us to know. Um, but also their wedding, you know, them, themselves, their individuals. What's quirky about them? What makes their wedding them? You know, I want, my, I want their guests to turn up to their wedding and say, this is so X and Y's wedding. Um, so the elements that are involved, they're spending a lot of time on these details. So let's bring that out. Um, so that's where our creativity really comes from. Um, it can be classic, but then your classic can be mixed with your something else in there, but it has to have a twist on them. Um, so yeah, creativity comes from every angle. Making time for it is interesting, mm -hmm. but as you mentioned, airports, apparently mm -hmm. a great inspiration aerial. Um, wouldn't say Stockholm is one, um, mm -hmm. soon isn't, um, but yeah, it comes from many different areas. Fantastic. And Daisy, can you tell us how you've gone from small proposals to planning the most expensive wedding of the year? I mean, I sometimes wonder um, <laughs> myself how I got that, <laughs> that gig. Um, well, obviously, I've planned a lot of proposals, and the couples absolutely love us. They're not married. They generally don't have kids, so we've just done the biggest thing in their life. So we have a constant stream of people, and obviously, if they have a decent budget, we will plan their wedding or their birthday. So we have quite a lot of... I think people think that they come to us, and then that's it. It's just we do their proposal, and we never see them again, but we don't. We have legacy clients, and they come back year on year on year, and I think the wedding that we've just done was six months... Um, and it was pretty huge, and I think quite a lot of the people in this room worked on it. There was 427 staff, I think, we hired for, for it, and there was only 250 guests, so it was an amazing experience, and I hopefully one day I'll be able to show people, but at the moment, <laughs> uh, I can't say a thing. Top so, yeah. secret. <laughs> um, Claire, you must have customers that come to you for a wedding cake, but there's an opportunity to upsell for christenings and birthdays. Is there a triode and tested formula to keep customers coming back to you? Um, yeah, I mean, I think the, the customer service is just so important. Um, it, more and more, I think people really expect and deserve like a really personal um, uh, experience. And so we're, you know, we're really small. I do, I do really, um, really t tiny, tiny events, you know, and then we also do quite big weddings. But 
Um, for us, it's a lot of uh, just the experience of coming into the bakery, sitting down with us, ordering what they want to order, and they just love the experience. They love that it's like weird and like sort of very <laughs> rustic and <laughs> kind of personal. Um, I think they're surprised, and that seems to that just seems to be really. Um, I said authentic before, but I think people just really like the experience. There's like a mm -hmm. person there. It's not just online. It's not just um, over the phone, although we can do both of those things as well. But it's just really about um, the, yeah, kind of relating to people and helping them. And then they like it and they come back. Fantastic. And um, so, Sh Sasha, moving forward, do you what's your kind of five-year, ten-year plan? Do you know what? It's crazy, isn't it? Because me and Penny sit in all these meetings all the time, like we all do with these couples, and the first thing they say to me is, when are you getting married? You know, when are you going to have a baby? What's your wedding going to be like? Uh -huh. And I just think, honestly, you're rushing me quicker than I'm rushing myself. Like, stop putting pressure on me. Um, <laughs> Penny's actually lucky because she's getting married. So we work together really well in a duo because she can just talk about her wedding and I can sit there as the moody uh, person who says I'm never going to get married. But I think it's important, you know, I mean, like, like I mentioned earlier, I think it's, it's good to have a vision. It's good to, for example, say, you know, I really wanted to get better at skiing, for example, when I was 22. I didn't put a timeline on, <coughs> I'm going to live in Austria for six months and do X, Y, and Z, but I achieved it. So I think it's important that, you know, we all have goals, we all have a vision, we all have aspirational lifestyles we want to be able to live. You know, if I say to myself, I want to live in this part of the country, I want to have this sort of money, how am I going to get there? I don't really know yet. Um, so I think, especially in weddings and events, because we work so much, just like Kay said, we can't even find the time. Mm -hmm. You know, never mind, um, you know, develop ourselves even more so I think the one thing is don't put too much pressure on yourself I try not to even now I think recent things that have happened in my life have really put things to, into perspective mm. and life is too short and I think you know especially things especially with goals you can work towards them goals mm. don't expect them to happen you mm. know overnight and I think I do have plans to go forward. We're opening raffles with Savoy in a couple of years, which is a super exciting, exciting project for us. So I hope to take on more of weddings and social events. Obviously, Savoy is just going from strength to strength, and it's just been an incredible journey of the whole hotel um, to be on. Hopefully, Mr. Barnes never leaves, <laughs> or else things maybe might change. But we're just so grateful to be in the position we are. And I think what I've learned from the past year, definitely, is by all these experiences that have happened, everyone in this room, just enjoy the moment. Mm -hmm. Because I look back now, even when I was in Cyprus and I was moaning on the mm. beach in 50 degree heat, sweating, wearing a pencil skirt, thinking, why have you forgot the ring? We're out on the beach and we can't get back to the hotel. Mm. I wish I would have enjoyed the moment more. Yeah. Because I think a lot of the time you don't enjoy it until it's a memory. And I'm never going to work at the Savoy again. And actually, you know, none of us even this. I mean, we sat in the Langham, one of the best mm. hotels in the world. Okay. You know, I think sometimes you've got to step away mm. sometimes I go back to Manchester and people are like oh what did you do at the weekend and I'm like oh we did this Saudi royal wedding and we did this yeah. and that and I'm like what did you do and she went oh I just did my shift in H&M and I'm like oh, <laughs> okay hon and then you know I kind of remember the, the world we are in and we all honestly it's need true. to be just so grateful of this industry and I am 100% flying the flag with this industry because people don't understand what goes into it and the hard work, every, all the speakers this morning have sort of mentioned the blood, sweat and tears that go into it. And mm. I don't know how Johnny's still doing it because <laughs> I was ready to walk away even just a short year ago, but the Savoy gave me that passion back mm. for the brides, for the right brides. And I think that's important because in hotels, we can't pick and choose. <laughs> we have to pick them all, <laughs> which is sometimes unfortunate, but know your path, but don't put pressure on yourself. Yeah. Um, because as I say, a moment, we're only here once, mm -hmm. so you've got to enjoy the moment. Enjoy the moment, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Well, we're nearly out of time. Thank you so much to our expert panel. I think they've really demonstrated why they are amongst the best in the business. I do hope you found this panel informative and helpful. I know I certainly have. Um, and if there's any questions, feel free to ask them. This is a question for Farima. I'm really impressed. I did not know you'd been in business as a florist for just a short period of time. So actually, it begs the question, how on earth did you do it? How have you managed to enter into what is obviously quite a crowded market? There are plenty of florists around, and there are plenty of celebrity florists and luxury florists and international florists. What, could you give us tips on like, what you think you've done in this short period of time that's actually given you that kind of, you know, I, I know you as someone who's, you know, developed a relationship with Brockett Hall, for example, but you must have done way more. So I'm curious to know what tips you've got. 
Um, yeah, I, I do have a few tips. Um, well, they apply more to me, and I think it's, it, ha it was very difficult. When we opened the shop, I didn't know it would survive. Um, it was extremely, extremely hard um, at the beginning for the first few months. And then I decided that I was going to focus on a specific market. I had to focus on one market. I wasn't going to try and do whatever came my way. That was really, really important to me, even if it meant that I was going to wait for that business. And that's what I did. Every product I created is a high-end product. Everything we sell online is high-end. Every type of wedding or event we try and do, or our corporate partners or our brand partners are all high-end. And that was very important. Yes, I came from a background where I dealt with people like that all the time, but it was very important to focus on what I wanted to do. I think it would have been much harder had I thought, oh yes, I, I, I can do three different types of brands of weddings. I can do a signature brand or except like Colin Cowie does, for example. He does different sort of brands. Um, I didn't have, I, I'm not a spring chicken. I have been around a long time, and for me, it was really important to align myself to focus into, in one market. Um, and I, I think that's worked. I think that's what I've done. I think that's helped. And it, it really, really is really important, and I know I harp on about it all the time, but I have surrounded myself with amazing people who have taught me, who have mentored me, who've guided me, and I listen to their advice. I don't just say, oh yeah, I'm just gonna do whatever I want anyway, thanks for your advice. I actually do listen to them, and most importantly, I have to say, and some of my colleagues here will know, my husband, he is a real driving force in this business, also a lawyer, but without him, none of this would be possible, none of it. Um, he pushed me, he's pushed me every single day, he's lifted everything, he's moved everything, he drives all the vans, and yet he's also a global general counsel. So that, I, I really, really do think there are several aspects as to how I've done it. There's not one, one answer to this question, and it literally is 365247. That that's literally what it is, for me. Thank you very much, ladies. That was a fantastic panel. Thank you.